Welcome once again to the Images in Focus show. I'm Juan Pons, and with me, as always, is my great friend, David Swindler. How are you doing, David? I'm doing great. Can't wait for the show today. Juan, how about you tell them what our topic is? Sounds good. So today, our topic is mirrorless camera. Why we both, David and I, shoot mirrorless cameras. You know, I believe that mirrorless cameras is really the future of photography. Um, you know, we've been shooting with uh, reflex, single reflex cameras for a long time you know, with film and then with digital. And, you know, photography has gone through such a transformation in the past, you know, I don't know, 10 years. And I think the latest transformation that we're seeing is this transformation into mirrorless. And like with anything else, you know, change is hard. A lot of people resist change. But I think that mirrorless is really the future of photography. What do you think? I couldn't agree more. You know, the industry is definitely shifting towards mirrorless, and there are many advantages to using a mirrorless camera. So during the show, we're going to kind of touch on what those advantages are. We'll go over some of the myths. And there's also a few disadvantages, too, that we'll kind of touch base on just so that you can make a more informed decision when if you're looking to invest in a mirrorless system. Yeah, I mean, you know, and if anything is a testament to how we believe in mirrorless, both David and I switched over to mirrorless a long time ago, only because we saw the light, we saw the benefits of this technology. So why don't we get started, um, David, with the myths? Because, you know, typically, whenever you tell people, you know, you're shooting mirrorless, or they see you with a mirrorless camera, they're like, well, but you know, I heard X, Y, and Z. And you're like, oh my God, this is not true. <laughs> a lot of it is, you know, people kind of resisting, you know, we have, as human beings, we have this need to kind of justify what we do or how we do it. You know, most people do. So a lot of times it's hard to accept that change. And I think that's where these myths come from. So what do we yes. talk about? It's one of the one of the first myths and one of the biggest myths here, right? And it's, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I, I see that camera, that's mirrorless, but it's not smaller than a DSLR. I thought the mirrorless were small, tiny little cameras. So why don't you tell us about that a little bit, David? Yeah, and that's so true. In fact, let me show you just a little example. Um, I've got a Sony A7R4 right here, and I've got a Canon 5D Mark III right here. You can see side by side that they're relatively about the same size. If you look at them from the side, um, you can see that the Sony is a little bit thinner, which is to be expected. You know, that's one of the advantages of a mirrorless camera is we don't have to have room for that mirror in front of the sensor. And so, yeah, it is a little bit thinner, but size-wise and weight-wise, they're pretty equivalent. You know, the weight might be 5 or 10% less, but in practice, you'd hardly notice that, you know, when you're holding them in your hand. And so that's one of the big myths I would say that's out there is that mirrorless cameras are significantly smaller and lighter. I would say, well, that's actually not entirely true. And then with the lenses, um, they've done tests where they've taken a bunch of mirrorless dedicated lenses and compared them directly with DSLR um, lenses and found that, you know, overall, they're about equivalent. You know, there's not necessarily a big size or weight difference between them. In fact, it's more a lens to lens difference. And that's because there's so many things that go into designing a good quality lens besides just making it as small and light as possible. Well, the other so, thing is, right, I mean, you're comparing, when you were comparing those two cameras, you were comparing um, both full frame sensor cameras, right? Exactly. Um, uh -huh. And that's where the cameras are going to be about the same size because they have to house the same size sensor. Um, and the lenses are going to be about the same size because the, sense, the lenses need to project an image to fit on that same size sensor. Um, and yes. actually, one of the things that we're seeing, right, with especially with the Sony lenses, is that a lot of these lenses, the Sony equivalent, are heavier than the than the DSLR equivalents because, you know, they're newer designs. They have more glass in them. You know, they're mm -hmm. higher quality, and that yes. makes them even heavier. Exactly. And so, yeah, you're not necessarily going to gain a lot of weight savings by switching to a mirrorless system. But as Juan said, if you really want the weight savings, then you have to go to a different size sensor, like a crop sensor or a micro four thirds. That is where you're really gonna get the smaller form factor. 
That's a now, great segue because I have a, I have a crop sensor Sony camera here that I want to compare it with a full frame sensor um, Sony camera just so that people can see. This is, you know, a um, A6000 and you see it's a really small size and nice and thin. And we compare mm -hmm. that with, this is an A9. Um, so if you can see the two different sizes between the A9 and the A6000, you know, there's a substantial difference, but that's because, you know, we're talking about a much smaller sensor. A lot of what you're seeing with um, uh, crop sensor DSLRs, you know, they are actually about the same size as a full-frame DSLRs, right? For some reason, a lot of those companies decided to keep the same sort of body shape, even though the sensor was, a, was much smaller. And they weren't really taking advantage of the smaller sensor to make the cameras that much smaller. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that Sony did when they first started coming out with their full frame mirrorless is that they made the grip on the camera so small that it felt like a toy to yeah. a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. It was actually really hard to grip, especially for people like with this large one. hands. Yeah, exactly. And so they decided, you know what, maybe it's better that we make that grip a little larger, kind of beef up the body size a bit just for ergonomic control. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it, you're absolutely right. And that's one of the things that we've seen with the iteration of these cameras, especially on the Sony side, because, you know, Sony, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, it's kind of a new entrant in this field um, from a camera design perspective. And they've gone through a really, you know, drastic um, iteration in their design, like you were saying, especially on the grip size. You know, they started with very small grips. These little 6,000s, these little 6,000 series of cameras are, crop sensor cameras, they have very small grips. And I find these, I mean, I don't have big hands and I find these hard to shoot with for extended periods of time. You know, for a little shooting here and there is fine. But, you know, when I'm shooting wildlife or something like that, my hand starts to cramping up because this grip is, is so small. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so that is definitely not, you know, that's a myth. That's not an advantage um, of, of, of DSLR or of, uh, mirrorless cameras that they, they have smaller or they're lighter and smaller and whatnot. They are, they are if you're shooting with the crop sensors. Now, we were saying there's no advantage when you're shooting with the full frame sensors, right? But Sony has both full frame and crop sensors, but other mirrorless manufacturers are shooting with crop sensors. And in those cases, like Fujifilm, for example, the cameras can be smaller, just like Sony's crop sensor camera is smaller. Um, and those lenses can also be smaller, right? Oh, much smaller. Uh -huh. So a lot of people really prefer, like, for their travel setup to shoot, like, with a phony, uh, like a Fuji X-T3 crop sensor. Mm -hmm. You know, that camera has a phenomenal sensor. If I was going to go crop sensor, yes. um, yeah. I would be happy shooting with that Fuji X-T3. Um, but, you know, I always love my image quality. I shoot a lot in very low light conditions. So mm -hmm. for me, I have to kind of stick with that full frame sensor just because that's that's my style of shooting. But, you know, if I was going to try to do a lot of street photography and I wanted something that's small, I can easily kind of fit in a side pocket or something, yeah, crop sensor would be awesome. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, for me, it's, it's all about the image quality, and that's really one of the reasons what led me to Sony uh, was the image quality. So, so certainly, you know, big mirrorless is another one, but um, the image quality and the way to get that image quality right now is going to be by using a full frame sensor. Now, you know, that's not to say that these crop sensor systems have, you know, incredibly good image quality. They do. They have very good image quality, especially when you compare it. You know, it's amazing to me, you know, how uh, much of image quality snobs would become. Right. If I yes. look at what I'm shooting today compared to what I was shooting, you know, 15 years ago, shooting Provia slide film at ISO 400, you know, the grain on that was like boulders in the image. It was just <laughs> unreal compared to what uh -huh. we're seeing today. So, you know, it, it, you know, if you're shooting a lot of low light, which I do as well, because I'm shooting wildlife early and late in the in the day, that that extra light gathering ability that full frame sensor is going to give you a much better image quality but for a lot of people you know a crop sensor camera is more than adequate enough um and one of the neat things about um and i, I don't want it to sound like a sony infomercial because i'm not but you know we have a lot of experience with sony because i've been shooting sony now for four years um and you know 
these little one, these little cameras have you can get um, lenses that are for designed for crop sensor. So you can get a really small setup with this camera, for example, that it will be a fantastic um, travel camera. But the advantage of it, though, is that you can also use your full frame lenses on it as well. So you could have a small um, crop sensor lens. I'll show you one right now. This is the, the little kit lens that comes with the uh, with the 6000. And this is a 16 to 50, which translates into a 24 to 70 lens. This little setup, this is a 24 to 70 on this little camera with incredible image quality, makes a great um, travel kit. But you can also use, for example, the big 24 to 105 with this as well. So you could, you know, the nice thing about having that system that detects both crop sensor lenses and full frame lenses is that you have much more versatility and a larger selection of lenses as well. Yep. Well, let's move on to another uh, myth about mirrorless. One thing that kind of made me hesitant about switching over is I heard that the battery life was horrible <laughs> on mirrorless. And in, indeed, you know, the first several generations of these mirrorless cameras did have much lower battery life uh, than the equivalent DSLRs. But, uh, you know, with the later cameras, that has been fixed. And I would say with my Sony a7R 3 and a7R 4 I get longer battery life than I ever got with my older Canon DSLRs. That's absolutely true. And, you know, there were, there were multiple reasons or factors why that was true. Um, one of them is, you know, certainly because you always have an LCD on with mirrorless cameras, right? Whether it's the viewfinder or the, the rear LCD, there's one of those is always on and they have backlighting to them. And that is one of the things that consumes the most energy on these cameras is the backlighting on that LCD. Even though they're LEDs, you know, they're low co power consumption lights, they're still, you know, the biggest consumer of, of power. Then the other difference is that, especially for Sony, um, and it's this, is, this may still be the case on some of the other camera manufacturers, you know, they came out because the bodies are smaller, they came out with smaller batteries, right? Yes. And if you look at, for example, here's a comparison of the old Sony um, battery compared to the new Sony battery. The new Sony battery is much bigger, much more powerful, mm -hmm. about the same size as, for example, the Canon batteries. Um, now, some of the uh, uh, crop sensor Sony cameras still use this little one, but some of them use the bigger one. So now the challenge is that, you know, for example, because I have both types of cameras, I now need to carry two types of batteries, which I'm not very happy about. <laughs> so that's that's yeah. the drawback to that. But that's okay. I'll take I'll take that and be able to shoot with one. I mean, and you're absolutely right, because there's oftentimes I will be shooting with one battery for two days straight. Oh, yeah. And you still have plenty okay. of power left. I, yeah, I couldn't say that with my 5D Mark III or 5D Mark IV, right? Yes, exactly. Sometimes I'll exactly I'll go two or three days without having to change a battery, and that's even with pretty heavy shooting. So I've been very impressed with the battery life on mirrorless cameras, and I don't think that should detract you at all from making right. a purchase. You know, and even then, you know, before the big cameras came out, you know, what I would do is, you know, these car these batteries are so small, I would just carry a few of these in my pocket. You know, they're pretty mm -hmm. inexpensive. You know, and you yep. just throw one or two in your pocket and. You know, who cares that it lasts a little, you know, shorter time? Um, as long as you have a few that are backups, you know, to me, that was not definitely, definitely not a, a deal breaker. Yep, um, absolutely. And then another myth here, you know, and this myth can kind of go both ways. Some people say, well, I thought mirrorless were cheaper or, um, and then other people say, well, you know, some of these camera brands carry a premium to them. And yes, both things are true. <laughs> you will find, for example, you know, uh, Sony, um, you know, and, and Fuji and Panasonic have some cameras that are incredible value for their money. Um, you, for example, you know, I can speak to Sony uh, better than any of the other brands because that's what I shoot again. Um, like the A7 series, the, the, the A7, not the A7R, not the A7S, but the A7 series. Like right now there's A7 Mark III. You know, for the price, that camera offers the most bang for the buck of anything that's out there in terms of um, uh, autofocus, in terms of image quality, in terms of, 
you know, uh, everything, you know, mirrorless technology in, ter in terms of the lenses available to it. So, um, you know, that's a myth that can go both ways, but, you know, you get what you pay for. And I think that if you look hard enough, you can find incredible value in some of these mirrorless systems. And you're, you basically are going to get what you pay for. And like Juan mentioned earlier in the show, you know, camera companies are investing their latest technology into their mirrorless systems now. Yes. And yeah. so they're going to get the best quality sensors. And so those sensors are going to cost some extra money. And, you know, being, being willing to pay for that up front, you know, you're going to get a very high quality system in the end. So I think it's, it's actually money well spent. You know, one thing that a lot of people, it's great that what you mentioned was awesome, and, and, and you know this, uh, and I know this because we have, you know, tech backgrounds, right? The mm -hmm. amount of time, effort, and money that it takes to develop a sensor is astronomical. It's just unbelievable. It's usually about a five-year development cycle from the time that, that they start developing or designing the sensor to the time it starts coming out of the factory is about five years. And then these yep. sensors need to be developed inside factories that cost billions of dollars, billions with a B. Um, mm -hmm. So it is an incredibly complex and expensive and difficult process. And that's why it takes so long for these sensors to come out, right? Oh, yes. It takes a huge amount of time. I used to work in the semiconductor industry designing NAND flash uh, microchips. And yeah, it would take at least five years, you know, from concept to actual production. And so, you know, these companies, they're having to put a lot of resources in early on in these development cycles and hoping that, you know, these it's going to pay dividends down the road. So, you know, I'm really encouraged to see uh, so, so much, so many new novel sensor designs coming out that this performs so well in low light conditions and just give amazing image quality. And that, like you said, Juan, is also what led me to switch to Sony because they were the industry leaders at the time mm -hmm. in image sensor quality. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, the interesting thing is that Sony makes more sensors than the entire rest of the industry combined, which is pretty remarkable, meaning they make more than 50, I think it's 55% of all the sensors out there that are produced on a yearly basis, mm -hmm. which means that they're putting an enormous amount of time and resources in research and development. Um, you yep. know, these guys produce sensors not just for their cameras, um, but for the iPhone and for a lot of security systems and for a lot of other camera manufacturers, believe it or not. You know, Sony produces sensors for Nikon because um, Nikon is really a small company. They're not very big and they mm -hmm. just don't have the resources mm -hmm. to develop their own sensors, you know, they do customize the sensors that Sony makes for them, but they're mm -hmm. essentially still Sony sensors. Um, and yep. because of that is, you know, why the reason why I switched for, to Sony is, okay, again, the image quality. These guys had just a huge advantage in the R&D. And as a matter of fact, that's really why Sony got into this game because they were developing all these sensors, you know, and they were selling the sensors to all the other camera manufacturers. And they were like, you know, we're making these sensors, we're selling these sensors cheap to these camera manufacturers. We could probably make more money if we made our own cameras and put our sensors in them. Yeah. Um, and that's really how this, this evolved. They went out and, and bought Minolta to bring in some of the technology and know-how in-house, and then they came out with their own, um, their own product line. So, uh, um, yeah, so don't, you know, the, the, the whole thing about, you know, sensors, I think, is incredibly important to understand. Um, now, again, you know, we can get bogged down with this and we can go down the rabbit hole of, of pixel peeping and looking at the, you know, you know, minuscule differences between sensors and quality between one camera and the other. Any other camera, modern cameras today just produce stunning results. So you can't go wrong with anything that, you know, you just gotta find what works for you. Um, exactly. And, and think about the differences between these. It's, it's pretty minuscule. You know, for us, you know, for, for professionals that do this day in and day out, we're always looking for that little edge in it, quality and performance. Mm -hmm. But for 99.9% yeah. .9 of the people, there, there's, there's virtually no difference, right? Yeah, and you can get very equivalent results, especially, you know, with post-processing technology that's come out recently, too. You know, what I find is having the better quality sensor just makes my life a little easier in the post-processing yes. world. Yes. And, you know, 
more often than not, I can work with a single image coming out of my Sony camera because of the expanded dynamic range. But, you know, with my older um, Canon cameras, you know, I could still get great imagery, but I might have to blend two exposures instead of work with a single image. So, right. No, I, I, that's that's a great point. You're absolutely right because, you know, it's amazing once I switch to Sony how few, uh, you know, how few times I shoot HDR anymore because I can get yeah. so much out of that single frame that I yeah. hardly ever shoot HDR. I mean, it's and it and you're right. I I and I think I mentioned this before on the last podcast is I like to spend as little time as possible in front of the computer working on my images. I'd rather be out shooting. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, I've spent enough time in my life in front of a computer that I don't want to <laughs> spend more working on my images. So the less time I need to spend on my images on the computer, the better off I am. And that's why I like that um, uh, image quality. Now, let's talk about some of the other advantages. You know, the top advantage for you and I, and I'll let you start, lead off with this. What's the top advantage of mirrorless? I would say the thing I like most about mirrorless is that what I see is exactly what I get. And when I go back to shoot a DSLR, it's actually really frustrating to me to look through an optical viewfinder, see this amazing image, hit the shutter button to take it, and then look at the back screen and realize it doesn't look anything at all what, like what it looked to that optical viewfinder. Right. It is like, I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're like you said, you, when you're shooting with mirrorless, is what you see is what you get. You actually see the end result before you even, yeah, uh, before you even press that shutter. You know, we're talking about the live viewfinder, right? A viewfinder that mm -hmm. actually shows you exactly what you're going to get. You know, a lot of yeah. folks, and this is another myth um, that we failed to mention earlier, but it's, it was true at one point and is no longer true. It was true that early on in the mirrorless systems, there was a lag in the viewfinder. So it was hard to shoot anything that was fast moving, any kind of sports, right? Because you would have a quarter of a second, half a second lag between what was happening in front of you and what you see the, through the viewfinder. That is yep. no longer the case. <laughs> any any yep. modern mirrorless camera doesn't have that issue because if they did, no one would buy it. So yeah. um, that's another myth that I wanted to dispel. So yeah, so but but going back to what you're saying, the live viewfinder, you know, the fact that you can, like you say, what you see is what you get. Plus, in addition to that, for me, is the histogram that I can f show in my viewfinder. The great thing about having an electronic viewfinder is that you can put all sorts of different things on that viewfinder. So for example, I have on the bottom right corner of the frame, I have the little histogram that I can see as I'm adjusting the image. And I have a little video that I want to show you guys real quick what that looks like. Um, let me switch over here and actually show you guys a really quick demonstration. So this is something that I shot at my desk so for you guys to see. And what you'll see is that um, I can, uh, uh, you know what I need to, it's hard to see the, um, I'm going to move this, this this screen a little bit so that you guys can see the uh, the histogram a little better. That's that's good. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys as I adjust the image what the histogram is doing. This is the view through the through the viewfinder. And you can see that as I adjust my my, my f-stop, that histogram immediately in real in real time moves to show me what my image looks like. And you can also see the effect on the viewfinder. You can actually see what's happening as the image gets darker or, or brighter. Let's play that again one more time real quick so you guys can see that in case you didn't get to see before. Look at the f-stop. As I increase the f-stop, the image gets darker and my histogram moves to the left. Yeah, so. yeah it's a, such a huge advantage. And you know what I find with mirrorless is that it actually prevents me from taking bad shots because like with the DSLR sometimes I'd point my light or my camera into a high contrast Ooh, that looks really good I'm going to take a picture only to realize later that it's just absolute rubbish but with the mirrorless you know I'm seeing exactly what the camera is going to capture and I can immediately tell hey this just isn't going to work you know this is just way too high contrast or the light's just not quite where it needs to be and I'll, and I'll actually not take the shot so yeah, I mean, the, the histogram you find here is absolutely, you know, essential for me, especially um, for those situations, right, that are 
kind of difficult uh, exposure wise. Yes. Right. I'm gonna let me bring up here a couple of examples real quick, as I think that that's that's important to show. Real quick, let me bring. Um, actually, this is this is one that is um, that I think is very emblematic or very uh, will sh will show this. So this is an image of a bison, and this is the image the, the type of image that I um, I like to show the most because it's one of those images that's the hardest to get the exposure right. And it's one in which you have, you know, a lot of white in the scene and a lot of darks, so, you know, kind of extreme exposure, you know, dark shadows, bright light. And you're trying to make sure that you capture all the details in there. So, for example, this bison in the snow, um, you know, have all these bright highlights on the, on the snow and have a very bright, a very dark bison. And I have a very dark tree that's framing my bison. If I did not have that live viewfinder and a live histogram, it would be hard for me to get the right exposure by maximizing the exposure that I'm capturing by exposing to the right. But because I can, through that viewfinder, look at that histogram, I can make my exposure adjustments even before I press that shutter for the you know, that very first shot. I can make sure my exposure is spot on. I can make sure that those whites are white, but they're not clipped. And that's going to bring as much detail as I can onto this scene as well. And there's a, there's a couple more images here that are similar to that. You know, here's another bison that's covered in snow. I want to make sure that that snow is nice and white, but not blown out. But I still want to be able to show the fur on the bison. And same thing here with um, some um, muskox. I have some bright snow in the background, and I have these dark, dark animals in the foreground. When you any situation in which you have these extreme contrast ranges, you know, are, are going to be so much easier to do with a mirrorless yes. camera because you're not having to shoot and then, you know, as we like to say, chimp, right? Um, yes. To get the right uh, to get the right exposure. Exactly. It's like basically taking a step out of the whole process. You know, with the DSLR, I'd have to shoot. I'd have to go look at my histogram and image review mode, make an adjustment to my exposure compensation dial, shoot again, uh, review the image again in image display mode. And once I got it right, then I know I could just keep shooting. But with mirrorless, it's just seamless. I'm just going right into it. I'm shooting and I know I'm nailing the exposure every time. That's right. And, you know, in, in, in addition to that, in, in conjunction with that, the great thing is, you know, remember, like you were saying, you know, when you're chimping, you know, with the SLRs, we'd have to look at the back of that screen. We'd have to take our yes. eye off the viewfinder, look at the back of that screen. And oftentimes it was impossible to see because the light was too bright. So you'd have to pull out your little uh, loop and put the loop on it and look through. And, you know, you're doing this. And, yeah, we try to do this when no action is taking place in front of us. But it takes such a long time to do all this that sometimes you would miss the action that was happening in front of you. Yep. Um, with the, with the, the advantage of an electronic viewfinder is that you can actually do the image review through the viewfinder. So you don't even yes. have to take your eye off the viewfinder. You have basically a built-in hood and loop, so you can actually see the image you know, in full quality through that uh, viewfinder as well. And for those of you that have uh, poorer eyesight, this is going to be a huge advantage for yes. you to be able to review your images through that viewfinder with nice, sharp detail. You don't have all that bright side light coming in, robbing the contrast. And it's really helped me improve my composition in the field when I can just really get a good look at, you know, that image in that viewfinder and then make adjustments while I'm there. Yeah, and you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the interesting thing is, you mentioned a good point, people who wear, who wear glasses, and which is, you know, a, a lot of people. How many times I've seen a client shooting with the camera without glasses on, they want to review an image. They got to put the camera down, put the glasses on, bring the loop, put the loop on, look at the camera, and then when they want to shoot, they got to reverse that process. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is very cumbersome. Very, very now, cumbersome. Now, one of the things that made switching to mirrorless easy for me, or easier for me, is the fact that you can repurpose your DSLR lenses on a mirrorless system, and so. Uh, Juan, if you could just uh, switch over to my screen here. Yep. And tell me once you're there. You're right. You're there. Go ahead. All right. Perfect. So this is a, just a quick little diagram showing the the side-by-side -side differences between a DSLR on the top and a mirrorless camera on the bottom. 
So with the DSLR, you know, the light would come through the lens and it would bounce off this little mirror here up to an optical prism. The optical prism would then bounce the light into this optical viewfinder. Now with a mirrorless camera, they've removed this mirror block. So you now the light comes through the lens and it just goes directly onto a sensor. And then the viewfinder up here is just a digital representation of exactly what the sensor is seeing. So that's why mirrorless cameras can be thinner. But the other advantage here is that any lens that will fit onto this DSLR with this particular back focusing distance or flange distance, as we call it, um, we can put that on a mirrorless camera. We just have to put an extender or an adapter on here that will push that lens out that equivalent distance. So let me show you an example here. Uh, you can put me back on regular mode. So here is a Sony a7R4. This adapter here is designed for a Canon DSLR lens. You can buy an adapter for any lens. I have an adapter for Nikon lenses that I can put on a Sony and so forth. And if I put this on, now this is pushing out the lens, that equivalent Canon uh, DSLR flange distance. And so I can repurpose all my great Canon glass with my Sony system. For example, I love this Canon 11 to 24 millimeter lens. There is no equivalent in Sony world for this particular lens. So I can just go ahead and put it on and voila, it works great on my Sony mirrorless camera. Now there are a couple disadvantages to using an adapter. One of those is that some of the more advanced features on these cameras cannot be utilized and things like being able to autofocus on the eyes, you know, depending on the type of adapter you have, well, that may not actually work. Um, also, the autofocus is going to be slightly slower because now you're adding an extra piece of electronics that that autofocus signal has to pass through. And on some of these adapters, they may only be manual focus or manual aperture. This depends on the quality of the adapter that you buy. There's so many adapters out there. We're not going to get into that discussion during this video. It's something that you'd kind of have to do your own research on, depending on what you want to get out of the adapter. The other disadvantage, disadvantage that I find is that these adapters sometimes aren't, don't have the best build quality. And because of that, um, they, they may not sit exactly flush. And so I do notice a little bit more focal tilt when I'm using an adapter on a mirrorless system. And sometimes too, it kind of feels a little chintzy, like you worry that your lens might fall off it or something. I've never actually had that happen. But yeah, some of these adapters, their build quality is a little subpar. Well, as, as always, you get what you pay for, right? There are some yep. really cheap adapters out there that, that are just really physical adapters. They mm -hmm. don't um, pass any electronics through. And, you know, and you know, you can get those for 30 bucks. And they may be fine for certain things, but they will feel absolutely, like you said, chintzy in that they feel like they're not holding on to that lens nicely. And if you're using a lens like you're, you are with that 12 to 24, which is a very expensive lens, it's a beautiful lens, you uh -huh. don't want to chance it with a $30 adapter. You want to go for the higher end adapter that's better built. And then some of yes. those adapters, like you were saying, will have uh, autofocus capability, will pass through the autofocus. So you'll be able to perform out of focus now it may not be the same performance that you would get by native using a native lens native sony lens but you know if you can repurpose lenses that's you know that's a huge advantage you know one of the one of the myths that you keep hearing people talking about and you hear this i still hear this is that there aren't as many lenses for these mirrorless systems and every time i hear that i kind of like shake my head i'm like this you know that's absolutely not true you know, at one point, it was the fact that some of the camera manufacturers like Sony didn't have a, a wide selection of lenses, right? Native lenses that they created. But that didn't really matter because through these adapters, you were able to use, you know, Sony, uh, Canon lenses, Sony, uh, uh, Nikon lenses, um, you know, all, Fuji lenses, all sorts of third-party lenses, Leica lenses, you know, uh, Zeiss lenses, all sorts of different lenses. So, you know, my argument is actually quite the opposite, that with mirrorless cameras, you have a much wider selection of lenses than you do with DSLRs because there are adapters that you can use because of that flange distance. And the flange distance really is the distance between 
the sensor, and the lens mount. And on mirrorless, that distance is really short. Whereas on DSLRs, it's much deeper. So because that distance is much shorter, via the adapters, you can use just about any lens as long as there is an adapter to it. And right now for the mirrorless systems, there's adapters for just about any lens um, brand that's out there. And now we've also seen that over time, these these, uh, mirrorless camera manufacturers are coming out with... um, uh, uh, with you know huge numbers of lenses, they have a large number of lenses that they can use. Now we talked yeah. about Sony and we talked about you know uh, Fuji and Panasonic and Olympus, but you know Sony, I mean Canon and Nikon are coming out with their own mirrorless systems now. I think they're finally seeing the light. Yes, and that's really encouraging. And the other thing I <clears throat> love seeing, like especially from the Nikon side, is that they're innovating on the mirrorless lens side as well. Yes. And they're utilizing the physics physics advantage of the mirrorless system to be able to create lenses that have much faster apertures than we could previously use with DSLRs, like f1.0 lenses, or even f0.8. You know that can be a huge advantage if you're shooting a lot in low light situations and you need those faster shutter speeds. Yeah, I mean, they, they will empty your pocketbook really, really fast, uh, the super oh, fast yeah. lenses. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that they're an option, uh, it's a great thing. And you know, it used to be that we mentioned mirrorless. It used to be kind of a brand fight. It's like, you yes. know, when you talk mirrorless, oh, that means you're not going to shoot Nikon, you're not going to shoot so Canon anymore, you got to go to a different brand. Well, now we're seeing, you know, Nikon and Canon come up with their own mirrorless system. So it's no longer a brand um, fight anymore. It's really more of a technology issue. Where is the technology going forward? Um, yes. So, you know, talking about technology, so a couple of other benefits are big things about um, uh, uh, mirrorless. Um, there's two things that I want to talk about that, uh, 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 or two among others that I want us to discuss. One is, you know, autofocus performance, right? Um, what we're seeing with the mirrorless cameras is that because of the way the autofocus works, they can actually do a much better job at autofocusing than some of the DSLRs. The DSLRs are having a hard time catching up or keeping up, if you will, with the mirrorless systems. And the reason is, I mean, I'm gonna bring up that picture again that you had earlier. Um, Let me show that over here. And on this screen. Okay, so when we look at the, the mirrorless at the bottom versus the, mirror, the uh, DSLR, once the light is coming in, one of the things that's happening is that light is hitting this mirror, right? That's here in a diagonal. And then the light is then going up to the pentaprism and out to the viewfinder. Now, the autofocus sensors on most cameras, on most DSLRs, are on the mirror itself right? That's how the camera is measuring the, uh, the focus for a particular shot. And it's using, you know, when we're shooting with a mirror, it's using what's called phase detect sensors, which are the best sensors to use for autofocus. They're the fastest and most sensitive uh, and most accurate. But what happens is when you press that shutter, what does that mirror do? That mirror folds up and comes out of the way so the light can then travel unimpeded down into the sensor. Well, guess what's happening when that mirror is up? Autofocus is no longer working, right? Because the autofocus sensors are outside of the path of the light that are coming in. So now when you take that shot, the mirror comes back down, the camera needs to go through acquiring the subject and focusing again and go through that cycle every time you make a shot. And that, because you don't have a continuous, the the, the autofocus sensors don't have a continuous view onto your subject, you know, it prevents those systems from being the best that they can. When you compare that with a mirrorless system, where on the mirrorless system, you have the autofocus sensors right on top, in front of the imaging sensor. And that light is continuously falling onto that sensor. It will you know, be able to keep track of those subjects throughout the entire image making process. So there's no time in which those autofocus sensors are, you know, on that mirror that's going up and down, and it's going to have a view of your subject 
the entire time. And this is especially important when you're shooting subjects that are moving fast. Yes. The SLRs, and the focus is, yeah. And yeah, when the focus is changing fast too, like with a DSLR, when I would be shooting like a fast frame rate, especially with the subject moving towards me, I knew I would probably miss focus on probably half of those images. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and it was frustrating because sometimes that perfect action sequence would be one of the f images that were kind of fuzzy or slightly out of focus. Uh, Juan, if you could just switch over to my screen quickly. Yeah, go ahead. So this is an image I shot while I was in Mongolia. And, you know, the light was perfect for a couple passes with this e eagle hunter riding with his, with his bird. And I was shooting at 10 frames per second. And he was riding straight towards me, so the focus had to change quickly. And at the same time, I was also zooming out as he was riding towards me to kind of keep keep him filling the frame. And I took about 65 images in this particular pass. And when I loaded those on the computer, I was so impressed to find that every single one of them were tack sharp. That yeah. never happened on my DSLR. And that way I could pick the perfect shot, you know, where I had the awesome happy horse expression. The rider's expression was great. And the eagle had its wings out and he was just <laughs> above the mountain, you know. And I didn't have to pick and choose uh, based on which images were sharp, which images were, were blurry. You know, one of the things that those cameras, the DSLRs do, you know, to try to keep track of the subjects as they're moving towards you, for example, is that they do predictive autofocus, meaning that when, while that uh, mirror is up and the camera has doesn't have a view onto the subject, what it did before that, it tried to ascertain the speed at which that subject is moving towards you. And it would predictively change the focus on the camera, on the lens, in order to try to capture the subject. From the time that it acquired a focus point, moved the mirror up, was able to trip the shutter and take the picture. You know, a fraction of a second happens between that, but a subject that's moving pretty fast may have traveled, you know, dozens of feet in that in that period of time, right? So uh -huh. yep. because, you know, the mirrorless cameras don't have that problem, that mirror that's in the way, they can be much better at maintaining the autofocus. You know, for me, the camera that I use the, for birds in flight, which are probably one of the most difficult subjects to use, shoot in wildlife, is the Sony A9. Because the autofocus on this camera is just absolutely unbelievable because it can maintain a lock on that focus even while it's shooting. And you can see that when you're shooting with a camera. You'll see that autofocus tracking the subject as it's coming towards you and as, you, as, you, as you're shooting uh, and as you're pressing that shutter. It's, it's just um, unreal how how effective it is. Yep. So, you know, I, I really love that advantage of mirrorless. The other advantage I like, and this is more for like landscape type photography, is that I don't, when I'm shooting on a tripod, especially with shutter speeds in the range of about one fifteenth of a second or one twentieth mm. of a second up to about the deadly half zone. A I call that the deadly yeah. zone. <laughs> yeah. The deadly zone right in there. You know, with my DSLR, I would have this mirror that would flip up every time the, it would take a shot. So I would have to either lock the mirror up and then take the shot independent of the mirror flip, or I would have to shoot in live view mode where the mirror was already flipped up. And that was something that, that's kind of annoying to always have to keep track of, you know, is my mirror locked up? Mm -hmm. and, am I gonna get any shake in the camera because of that mirror slapping back as the shot is taken? With a mirrorless camera, that's no longer an issue. I can shoot at any shutter speed knowing that there's not going to be any mirror vibration uh, happening in that shot. Uh, yeah, yeah that, is, that is a huge advantage. And, you know, some of these cameras still have a shutter that gets activated. Um, and that can introduce some motion, but it's definitely, you know, minimal compared to that mirror slap going up and down. Because that mirror is going super fast and slapping the camera around on the interior makes that camera shake. But even on a lot of mirrorless cameras, you can turn them into an electronic shutter only mode where there's not even a shutter if you don't want to. Some cameras by default, they're in electronic shutter, uh, electronic shutter mode only. But some of them will have the, the standard uh, shutter, then, but you can turn it into, you know, quote-unquote silent mode, which is the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, silent mode makes the, the camera completely silent, meaning there is no mirror slap noise, there is no shutter noise, there is no motor drive noise, even though we haven't had to deal with motor drives for a while. Um, 
And that can actually make a huge difference, you know, with wildlife, you know, that's really skittish, or it can make a big difference in a situation where you're trying to stay quiet and then, you know, kind of inconspicuous in the scene. Could be at a wedding, could be at a, you know, at a uh, at a news event. You know, you know those news events that you see on TV, and all of a sudden you hear the cacophony of fifty thousand cameras going off at the same time. Someday, <laughs> soon, I hope we'll never be able to hear that. People will be like, "What was that noise?" That people were hearing before. <laughs> yeah, yep, very, very <laughs> true. And so another thing that I really like about mirrorless cameras is that. Uh, since it is an electronic viewfinder, you're seeing exactly what the sensor sees. So if I have like dust or contamination on my sensor, mm -hmm. I can actually see that real time. And I know, hey, I've got a big old goober on my sensor. I can go and take the lens off the camera, take a blower and just blow off my sensor. And now it's clean. I can put the lens back on. I can verify that it is clean looking through the viewfinder, especially if I'm pointing up in the sky or something. And then I can go on and shoot. And I don't have to ruin a whole set of shots with a bunch of goobers that I that I either have to clean up in post or they might actually hit in critical areas of the image. And now I'm kind of screwed. Right. And, and you know, the, the neat thing about that is that right, with DSLRs, we always had this issue where, you know, where is that dust? Is the dust on the sensor? Is it on the lens or is it on the pentaprism or, you know, yep. somewhere around there? You know, many times, you know, the, the dust could be in the pentaprism. You would see it through the viewfinder, but it didn't show up in the pictures. And then you got sensor dust on the sensor, and you couldn't remember, was this dust on the pentaprism or was it on the sensor or whatnot? Now, if you see dust, you know exactly where it is. It's in the light path, so you need to do something about yes. it. Exactly. And like on workshops, I'd get so many people asking me, hey, I see this big old thing in my viewfinder, you know, it's like a big old spot up in the sky. I'm like, don't even worry about it. If it's a DSLR, it's just on your pen prism. It's not going to actually show up in your shot. But, and so then you'd have to worry about trying to clean a viewfinder and, you know, if that stuff bothers you. So uh, let me show you an example one. Okay. Uh, if you switch over to my screen here. Go ahead. So this is a, uh, sorry, the image is still loading. It's going to look kind of pixelated here. Um, so this is an image that I took up by Mount St. Helens. And I got up on this ridge a little before the sun came up. And I was looking through my viewfinder, and I noticed I had all kinds of goobers everywhere. You can see all these wow, goobers that's up like here a in the mirror corner. up there on the right. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, I know. It looks terrible. And then look at all these spots here. Look at this old big old spot. There's actually quite a few spots down here in the landscape too that are harder to see. And I was like, okay, this isn't going to fly. So I quickly took off my lens. I cleaned off that sensor. And then once the sun started spilling over the ridge, I was able to capture that image without any spots on it. And with a DSLR, I would have just shot this and got home later and been like, oh, crap, uh, I really screwed that up. Yep. And it, again, because what you see is what you get, right? If you're seeing it through the viewfinder, it's in your, in your optic path. So you got to do something about it. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the neat thing about this, too, about uh, another advantage, let me say, let me backtrack a little bit here. Another advantage of our uh, the new um, mirrorless systems is that by design, because these are mostly new systems, these camera manufacturers are having to come up with new lens designs. And we're seeing this on both Canon, Nikon, and, and Sony, and Olympus, and all these different companies. Um, that they're coming up with new lenses to fit these new formats. So what, what's happening is that new lens designs are coming into the forefront. Now, lens design, in case you're not aware, has taken a huge leap in the past five or so years, meaning that new technology has come into play with into place with um, uh, um, um, what you might call it, with design, with the computer aided design in the designing of the lenses. So n camera manufacturers can come up with lenses that are much sharper, much faster, and much better than what they used to be before. When the camera manufacturer had a, a, a lens um, that they had designed, they spent millions of dollars designing. And now that lens design is 10 years old, and new coatings and new lenses and new technology, new approaches have come up. You know, they really have to think hard whether they want to spend millions of dollars in developing an updated version of that lens when they already have one that may not be the best but um 
but it serves a purpose. Well, these new camera manufacturers, you know, are putting a lot of money in developing new lenses. And we're seeing that with these camera, these camera manufacturers, for example, Fuji has an amazingly beautiful 100 to 400 millimeter lens. It's super sharp, very small, um, and it's a favorite of a lot of people. Sony's done the same. They come up with a 100 to 400 that beats the pants out of lenses that were designed, you know, 10 years ago by Canon or by or by Nikon. And it's not necessarily that Sony or Fuji has better know-how. It's just that these are better designed or newer lenses with newer design. It's just like a vehicle, right? A vehicle yep. that was developed in 2020 is going to have much better performance in most cases and better technology than one that was des you know, designed in 2010 or 2000. There's no question yep. about it. Just by the sheer fact that there's new um, lenses, they're taking advantage of newer technologies to develop these lenses that come out, that, you know, that perform a lot better. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, if you're a video shooter, uh, one thing you'll really like about mirrorless is that the autofocus in video works much better. And that's because you can utilize the camera's best focusing method, which Juan described is the phase detection method. You can use that while you're shooting video. Whereas with a DSLR, the mirror had to be flipped up while you're shooting video. And so it'd have to use more of the contrast detection method. And so another big reason to switch to mirrorless if you shoot video is that your autofocus will be faster and more accurate. Yeah, that, that's right. It is. It's a huge advantage. You know, one thing that uh, we should have mentioned when you talked about you know, when you're looking through the, through the viewfinder and seeing gunk or when you take an image of seeing gunk, one of the cool things about mirrorless is that they're much easier to clean the sensors, right? And that's because yep. the sensors are right there. They're really... You know, because that flange distance is so close. You know, when you've, if you ever clean the sensor on a DSLR, you know that that sensor is like deep down in there. And you actually yep. kind of feel funny. You have to put the camera in a special mode for the mirror to flip up and for the um, shutter to open. And then you have to put the swab down into that deep chasm where that, where that sensor is. With, the, with uh, mirrorless, the sensor is right there. It's at the very yeah. forefront. You can see that there on the... Um, on David's images, it's very, very top. And the default mode for these cameras is not to have the shutter open. So you don't have to put them in any kind of special mode to do mm -hmm. any sensor cleaning. Now, my experience is that because, you know, that, that this whole thing is a double-edged sword because if you have that sensor up close like that and open, it's more susceptible to getting dust when you're swapping lenses. So you have to be a little bit more careful about swapping lenses. But yeah. by the same token, something that David and I do is that we are more uh, diligent about blowing the dust off those sensors using that dust blower. You know, every, you know, two or three, for me, every two or three lens changes, I make sure I grab that dust blower and I blow the dust on the sensor, even if I don't see anything, you know, so that I can make sure nothing is there and whatnot, because it's so easy and convenient to do. I don't have to put the camera in special mode or anything. It's just super easy um, to clean. So I do it more often. Absolutely. And so I find that overall, just because I'm, uh, it's so much easier just to blow off the sensor that, you know, I collect less dust in my images right. when I'm shooting mirrorless. Because you, you do it more right? often. Yeah, you do it more often just because it's easy. But, you know, there are some attendant challenges, you know, with shooting mirrorless. Oh, yeah. And um, one of the things that I will mention is that many of these mirrorless lenses that are coming out no longer have the manual type focus ring on them with like a scale where you can see exactly where that ring is at. And it's using like the wire focus method where you're seeing a digital scale on the back of your camera screen. So if you're shooting like astrophotography or shooting in low light situations where you have to manually focus, well, like it can be a little more challenging because I can't just set my ring to a preset focus distance or, or tape my focus ring in a particular location. You know, I'm actually going to have to acquire focus within the camera using the manual focusing method. Now, the... On the flip side, I would say it's much easier to do the manually, manual focusing 
when you're using the mirrorless systems because they have the higher quality sensors. You can look through the viewfinder, you can see a brighter image. Um, I, I can focus on a star in the middle of the night, for example, much easier with a mirrorless camera than I ever could with a DSLR camera. But you do have to know that, you know, without that little scale on some of these lenses, it can be a little more challenging um, to, um, to do the manual focusing. Yeah, and a lot of the, one of the neat things also is that a lot of these um, um, mirrorless cameras, when you go into manual focus and you turn that ring on, it will automatically, even when you're looking through the viewfinder, it will actually zoom in on the, a particular part of the image. So you can actually do fine focusing and actually get yep. that image really nice and focused. You know, we used to do that a lot with live view, right? On DSLRs, you know, with, with uh, when we put the, the, the mirror up or go into live view, we would then zoom in, you know, but we typically had to be on a tripod or the camera needed to be kind of still for you to look back and you had to move back a little bit for you to be able to see the uh, the screen on the back of the camera. Now you can do all this with a viewfinder, um, and 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 like you said, be more accurate and easier to do manual focus because of that. Yep, exactly. So <clears throat> and then so, the other thing too is you right. also can enable things in your viewfinder like zebra stripes, right? Or you know sometimes they'll put like little over color overlays that help you see which parts of the image are in focus. Mm -hmm. And people really like that advantage, too, of being able to quickly manually focus and kind of see what the zebra stripes tell them or, and then go ahead and shoot. Right. I mean, the zebra stripes tell you whether an area is overexposed, and then you get the focus peaking, which is, the, like you were saying, the color overlay that shows you what part of the images are in focus. Um, but for me, you know, I'm notorious for, you know, not paying – it's not paying attention. It's just that I'm trying to get the right angle on something, and oftentimes my horizons are not straight. Right, being mm -hmm. able to have that artificial horizon right in my viewfinder is oh, huge. Yeah. Oh, it's you know? big time, yeah. Because you know, I, oftentimes I, we're not standing up; we're like kneeling down, or we're down on on our side, or on our belly, and it's hard to get the image, the, the camera level. So that level to me is absolutely crucial. Oh yeah, I used to shoot so many crooked images with the DSLR, especially like wildlife. Yes, and I have like I can see the horizon back there, and it's like way off. You know, with my D with my mirrorless, you know, I just have that electronic leveler right in the viewfinder. I can instantly make that correction and ensure I'm staying right where I should be. Well, you know, but you know, we've talked about all these advantages, right? And uh, there are some challenges, you know, with with mirrorless. Um, and you know, and the biggest one that I see is the steep, a potentially steep learning curve, meaning you're oftentimes having to learn a whole new system. Now, if you stay within, you know, let's say you switch from Nikon to the Nikon mirrorless systems, your 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 um, your learning curve is not as big. Yes, there are some things that are different, but you're still using a system that is more or less familiar to you—a whole menu system, ergonomics, all that kind of stuff that are pretty familiar to you. Um, same thing with you shooting Canon. I mean, yeah, they had mirrorless Canon, mirrorless Nikons, you know, vary substantially in, you know, physical size and physical layout than their DSLR counterparts. But you're still within a familiar ecosystem, if you will. But if you're switching from, you know, let's say Canon to Sony, which is both what David and I did, that can be pretty daunting to a lot of people and it may take a little while and if you're not strong enough you can you know revert back you may be like oh this is too hard and then you go back to your comfort zone you go back to shooting with the canon or whatever other system was and it makes it harder to do that transition so that is one of the biggest challenges that i see moving to mirrorless yes there is the whole thing about transitioning from one system to another and the financial you know repercussions that that entails um uh, but you know you there are multiple ways of handling that um and we maybe we'll talk about that a little bit near the end here um but the whole system about uh, the whole thing about learning a new system can be pretty challenging um you know especially you know, at least for us I, I know for me and i think for you too david but i don't think you and i have especially talked about this you know when when i switched to, to sony the menu system in sony has been just an absolute mess the entire, you know, through the entire period. Yes. It, and it has gotten better. The past, you know, I don't know, the past two years, they've actually done, they've gotten so much flack for this that they've mm -hmm. actually tried to organize it in a way that makes sense. 
But yes. honestly, mm -hmm. one of the things that happened was that the best thing that could have ever happened is that they now allow you to create your own um, menu system, right? So I mm -hmm. have a couple of slides so you can actually see what my menu system looks like. So I'm able to customize, create a bunch of screens of my most frequently used options. So I can customize these menus to have the, um, the items that I use the most and just simply go to these menus and not have to hunt through the myriad of other menus to find the functions that I'm looking for. For me, you know, I wish it was there from the very beginning. And I think for people now transitioning to a new system like the Sony, this is going to be a huge uh, advantage to them. Absolutely. Um, another challenge, potential challenge with these mirrorless systems is I found that the cameras tend to be more fragile and they yeah. tend to have less impact resistance and poorer, poorer weather sealing. And for those of us who are shooting like pretty rugged, extreme environments, you know, that is an important consideration. Now, some of that may be brand differences. And I'm excited to see a lot of these newer mirrorless cameras coming out with better weather sealing mm -hmm. and better impact resistance. But do note that, you know, that is a potential drawback uh, to shooting with them. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and I think part of that is because, you know, you know, they're trying to come up with new innovative design, new systems. Um, you know, Sony is kind of new to the space as well. You know, Olympus isn't and Fuji isn't new. But, you know, they're trying to come up with new innovative systems. And, you know, it does take quite a bit to, to, to design and engineer a camera that is as rugged and reliable and, and as what we've seen from, you know, systems like Canon and Nikon with the one series cameras. I know with the within Canons, you could actually use those things as hammers and nail nails into the ground, into wood if you wanted to, and the cameras would keep on ticking. I would never dream of doing that with my Sony camera. I, I just don't feel that is at the same level of ruggedness. You know, you are definitely way harder on equipment than I am um, because of you know the extreme locations that you go hiking in and whatnot. And have you found, have you had many failures with your Sony, for example? I'm just curious. I, I actually have. I've probably had to replace two or three shutters on them. Wow. And, you know, just either from impact damage or just it just fails on its own from, you know, just me shooting in very rugged, intense environments. Mm -hmm. And also, too, you know, I, I shoot a lot with the adapter on, on the camera. At least I did when I first right. transitioned over to mirrorless. And whenever you shoot with an adapter, your weather ceiling is going to go way down. Because right. oh, now there's yeah, another yeah. path for crap to get in there. You know, if you have right. blowing sand or water droplets or whatever it may be. And that also can impact the, the longevity of the camera. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, when you using, I mean, I don't know of any of those adapters that were weatherproofed or weather sealed at all. So, I mean, uh, once you put that on, forget it, all bets are off for sure. Um, so, in the, the last, I think the last challenge that we want to talk about is a smaller ecosystem, and that kind of sounds weird, but it is it, to a certain extent it's true. We're starting to see this change a little bit now, especially with Sony, with how popular the Sony brand has become. But we are seeing that change also with systems like Fuji. Fuji is, is very popular as well. And what I mean by a smaller ecosystem is that there have been less brands or third-party brands that have targeted those systems for their products. So, for example, you know, Tamron and Sigma. Those are the two biggest third-party lens manufacturers. And they've been making lenses for, Sony, for, uh, sorry, for Canon and for Nikon for the longest time. But you're now, you're now just now starting to see these guys come out with dedicated lenses for these brands. So, for example, for the longest time, Sigma had their Sigma mount, and then they had adapters that you would have to use to use those lenses with, you know, Sony or some of the other mirrorless cameras. Now you're starting to see a reversal. That you're starting to see Sony, uh, Sigma, and Tamron come out with lenses specifically geared towards the systems. On the other hand, there were other lesser-known lens manufacturers that were already making lenses for these camera systems. So on one hand, you had less, you know, third-party support, a smaller ecosystem. But on another hand, you had other newcomers taking advantage of that gap that was there. Same thing happens, I think, with um, um, 
uh, software systems. There are a number of software uh, systems out there that people would use to um, support their camera systems. They could be systems that allowed you to shoot tethered, for example, or allowed you to do like focus stacking externally and things of that nature that they would actually support Canon and Nikon because those were the two, you know, 800 pound gorillas of the industry and they didn't necessarily have support for these other brands. But again, that is changing. These other brands are gaining so much in popularity. They're the hottest new thing. Um, and they're innovating much faster. So you're starting to see this, this ecosystem kind of develop and in some cases surpass what we used to see from Nikon and, and, Can and Canon before. Yes. <laughs> So, you know, overall, Juan, I think this has been a great discussion um, on mirrorless systems. You know, we've kind of touched on many of the major advantages that we find in shooting them. We've touched on a few of the challenges and also kind of gone over, you know, some of the ways that you can start changing over to a mirrorless system if you haven't done so yet with the use of adapters and so forth. And, you know, if you guys have questions that we didn't really cover in this video or, you know, anything else that uh, you're wondering about, you know, just put, shoot us a, put a comment in the video or join, or better yet, join our Facebook group. The, our Facebook group is called Images in Focus. Go on there, post a comment, and we'll be happy to kind of respond to that and, and give you additional information and insight. Yeah, we'll have links on the comments on this video to, um, to the Facebook group. We also have an email address. It's info uh, images in focus .photo that you can send a message to. And that goes to both David and I. Um, but look in the comment section uh, on the um, uh, on this video because we'll have links to all those things there. Now, if you enjoyed this video um, and it's something you want to keep seeing, make sure to subscribe here on YouTube and make sure to click on that little bell so that you get notified when we post new episodes. And please share with your friends as well. If you're enjoying this and you're getting something out of it, you know, the one thing you can do for us is share with your friends so that we get to share this information with more people. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. And we can't wait until our next episode. Take care, folks. See you soon. Goodbye.